Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Shane Riley. I'm the front end developer for HashRocket. We are a uh, Ruby on Rails consultancy primarily. Uh, we're just now getting into uh, Objective C development for uh, iPhone, iPad, etc. Um, I wanted to go through uh, a bit about how we have started developing our jQuery plugins. Uh, a lot of times when we need to solve a specific problem, what, the plugins we come across, they tend to have far too many options for, uh, for what we're looking for. We want something that's uh, uh, as slim as can be, does exactly what we need, uh, and is also something that, that we're comfortable with uh, digging into and, and modifying on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so I wanted to kind of share that process we've, we've started doing uh, with our plugin development. So plugins, I imagine nearly everyone here has used them. How, how many people have used a plugin on a project? Man, figured every hand would be up. Uh, so plugins, they're not just for slideshows and autocompletes, although I'm sure you've used them most often for those. Uh, they abstract repetitive code for reuse, uh, which is nice. Uh, it, you're not copying and pasting like uh, the dynamic drive days, if anyone remembers that. Uh, it allows you to customize uh, by passing in an options hash. Uh, so uh, the usual plugin pattern, rather than having 12 arguments and passing in null for eight of them, you have an options hash where you just uh, add the options that you need to override. Uh, you've got portability between projects. Um, it's very easy to encapsulate plug-in code and move it from one file to, or one project to another, uh, simply by including that file. And it's easier to test, uh, as, as we've already seen. Um, so I'm not going to go too far into that, but uh, let's go into uh, the anatomy of a plug-in. This is a very basic example skeleton uh, of how you would write a plug-in. This is taken right from the jQuery docs website, which I've been told by Yearn is severely out of date. Hopefully, uh, that'll be fixed soon. Okay. So what we got here, uh, as you've seen in, in Ben's uh, talk here, we've got an immediately called function where we pass in the jQuery object. Uh, that's already been explained yet. Uh, and then we attach a method to the buck.fn object. Uh, the usual uh, behavior, you, you get an options object. Uh, you extend that options object with the defaults, as you see on line six through nine. So uh, we've got the extend method being called. We're storing that extended object in the settings. Uh, and then we do whatever plugin code we need in the each loop and make sure to return the jQuery collection main chain, maintain chainability. So if you've got an itch to scratch, there's always a plugin for that. In fact, there's probably 20 plugins for that. So why would you go through and, and develop your own plugin? Uh, for us, primarily, it's the learning experience. I, I think figuring out how uh, how you develop a plugin to to serve that need uh, allows you to identify a number of uh, pitfalls and issues that you normally wouldn't come across, and that ends up making you a better developer as a result. Uh, so let's take a uh, contrived example of an accordion plugin uh, and put that to use. So we've got uh, the same sort of uh, pattern that we saw in the example. We've got an options object we're extending. Uh, we're going to iterate over the collection, make sure to return the collection for chain chainability. Uh, and then internally, we're going to cache each instance of the collection uh, just to make it a little bit easier to read. Uh, so let's put the plugin to use. Uh, we're going to call it with all the defaults, so we're just going to call uh, dot accordion on it. But then the, the client says, hey, you know what would be great? If we click on this link in the footer and they take action on this particular thing, uh, we want the last instance of this accordion to behave differently. We want it to animate in a different way. You gotta be kidding me. We handpicked this this plugin because it's it serves exactly the purpose that we need. You know, it doesn't have this functionality built in. What do we do? Do we go out and search for another plugin? Do we modify the existing one? Uh, if we modify the existing one, what are what are the problems that we'll encounter along the way 
uh, throughout the rest of the development of the application. Uh, first thing you want to do is rebind your plugin. This is kind of the quick and dirty way of achieving what the, what the client wants. So rather than modify the plugin and, and have the possibility of the plugin being overwritten when a new version comes out and another developer not knowing you've overwritten it, uh, we're going to unbind the click event, reinitialize the plugin with a new option. The problem is you need to add the option to the plugin. So we're back to the issue of not being able to, to update the plugin without shoehorning this back in. So let's continue down this path, modify the plugin. We're going to create a new anim animation method object, or property rather, on the options object. Uh, and then just use the array notation to call the method uh, based on what's on the options. So by default, we'll call slide toggle. Uh, for what the client needs, we just want to call toggle with, with a particular uh, speed and callback. So what happens if you do update the plugin? If it needs to be updated, uh, the changes have to be retrofitted. So a pull request could be submitted to the, the plugin author uh, if they're using Git, but it's not guaranteed it'll be introduced into master. So you may still have to continue shoehorning this in with each release of the plugin. So another option is changing the options after the fact. But it's difficult to change the options in, in this case once the options are passed in and the plugins initialized. Um, we don't have that exposed anywhere on the object, so we don't have any way internally or externally to modify that without unbinding and rebinding it. Uh, so you may need to unbind and rebind events in this instance, which is really messy. Uh, you may also need to keep track of all the elements with the plugin called on them for this purpose. Uh, because as, as we saw, and as I'll go over uh, a little bit later, there's no namespacing of that event. So you don't know which event you're unbinding uh, when you call unbind click. You may be unbinding some other plugin code, and now that's, that functionality is no longer be there. Uh, and it may also be difficult or impossible to unbind only th those elements, as I just mentioned. But uh, let's start improving on this, this plugin pattern. So what we're going to do is read the plugin name from a plugin object to start with. Uh, so this is going to be used for namespacing your events and uh, provide a single point of editing when naming conflicts arise. So if you have similar plugins uh, throughout the site and they're, they're being included on the same page, you can change the namespace of this one plugin uh, to something more specific so that they're not stepping on each other's toes. Uh, so we're going to provide a plugin name as object property. Uh, we're going to read the plugin name from the object, uh, use it for the namespacing, and uh, provide a single point to modify that in the future. Uh, we're going to go through and namespace the event bindings. Uh, have an option to live bind an event or bind it to a context, uh, both with the, the new on method. So where do we start with this refactor? Uh, well, if you look further down in the documentation on plugin development, uh, there's an example that's close to what, we, what we're shooting for. Uh, and I'm just going to break this apart into a couple pieces here. Uh, first, we've got an object that's going to store all of our methods uh, that are going to be called either internally or externally uh, related to this plugin. Uh, so we've got an initialized method that's going to do the, the event binding and whatnot. The event binding, as you see, is going to trigger the reposition method also on the same object. Uh, so it's nice, neat, encapsulated. You know where everything is. Uh, and then we have an option to call the method externally. Uh, if we pass in a string instead of an object, we can call any one of these individual methods from outside of the plugin, uh, which is a tremendous benefit uh, the more you get into customizing plugins. Uh, and then, of course, we initialize the plugin by attaching the event. So let's start rewriting with this sort of pattern. So we create our plugin object, uh, name and accordion appropriately. Uh, and as you see here, we've got a name property of accordion. That's going to be used, again, for, for namespacing uh, and for attaching to the buck.fn object. Uh, we've got the same after callback as before. And then we've taken the click event and abstracted that into a method called toggle. Uh, and it, what you'll see in the initializer, uh, we're going to bind accordion.toggle to the click event. And then we're going to add the namespace to that click event so it's easier to identify and unbind that 
with the teardown method. Now, why are we calling the method in here? Uh, from what I found, uh, it's a little bit easier to understand uh, what's going on when you override the method externally. Uh, what we're going to do is um, store an instance of this object, this accordion object, uh, and outside of the plugin, you'll be able to modify that method because it's publicly exposed. However, since that was already bound, there's a pointer to the original ob or the original method, uh, so your modified method is not going to get called. In this instance, the modified version is always going to be called because it's always going to look it up and get the most recent version of it. So uh, let's initialize the plugin. Uh, we're using the accordion name property to make sure that uh, we're using the same namespace. Uh, it's much easier to change the plugin name this way if conflicts arise, of course. Uh, and then the first condition provides the ability to call methods uh, by name on the collection. Uh, the second condition uh, will run the initialization. So if we pass in an object instead of a string, we know to initialize. Uh, there's a separate copy of the plugin created as a plugin instance. Uh, that we're later going to use to attach as a data object so we can access it externally on a per element basis, per collection basis, whatever you're gonna do to, uh, to override. Uh, and then we can override the toggle method. Somewhat similar as before, it's still a bit disgusting how, we, uh, how we're doing this. So we wanna try and clean this up a bit more um, because this gets a little spaghetti-like. We also have lost our new option for the animation method, so we need to get that added back in. Uh, so we're gonna put a new uh, option for animation method. I, again, call the method with the array notation. Uh, and now we can just change the method name rather than rewrite the callback. Uh, so when the user clicks on the link in the footer, uh, the last post needs to have a different uh, animation method, we just change that. It's much cleaner. Uh, so let's talk about some other optimizations. Uh, we want to create a teardown method. Um, so in this example, uh, this will unbind all the namespace methods and remove any data stored uh, on the objects. Uh, so those separate instances of the, the plugin object, those will be removed along with the events. Uh, much easier to do now that we've got it namespaced. Uh, we're going to add live binding and context. So uh, if the context is set, the event's bound to the context rather than each element individually. Uh, otherwise, the event's live bound. Uh, this makes a big deal, uh, particularly when, when dealing with tabular data and having some sort of events on the table cells uh, or really large pages in, in general where you're listing a tremendous amount of content and you want the same event called on each individual element. Rather than binding that to each one, uh, you bind it on the context. Uh, a lot of plugins I've seen don't, don't really do that. They just bind it to whatever the collection is. Uh, then we're gonna bind the event to the parent element. The, these are our options that we've created in order to do that. Uh, so we've got the element that it's uh, going to trigger the click event on within the context of the details container. So let's bring this all back together. Uh, we've got a new development pattern uh, where we're creating an internal plugin object to contain defaults and methods. Uh, it makes it much cleaner to, to find the method that you're, you're needing to work on, uh, that you need to modify. Uh, gives you the ability to call methods directly from outside of the plugin. So, for example, the destroy method, rather than, than that being uh, internal and, and you having to uh, somehow call that externally, we've already got a way to call that externally along with the animation methods, things like that. So if you need to call it on its own rather than trigger the click event, you can. Uh, you can create and store standalone plugin instances. Uh, so as we saw, we were writing each instance of the plugin object on the element, so you can override it on a per element basis. Uh, the plugin's namespaced, makes it a lot easier to determine which events we need to remove. And we've got the teardown method to facilitate that. So the benefits of this method. Uh, you can write your own overrides to suit your individual needs. Uh, you don't have to go hunting for a different plugin when the requirements change. Uh, you also rarely have to crack open the code in order to modify the plugin. Uh, 
you can upgrade to a new plugin version without much concern that your, your overrides are going to be lost. Uh, since you're not modifying the plugin code itself at this point, you can just upgrade to a new version as long as the plugin author is using the same sort of methods and whatnot. Everything will still work. You'll still override what needs to be overridden. Uh, and again, it's overriding makes, or overriding this stuff is much easier as a result. Uh, so I got a bit of recommended reading and uh, a disclaimer. When I started putting this talk together uh, and submitted it, I thought I had come across some amazing new way to, uh, to develop plugins. And it turns out, as a lot of people have, have pointed out on the, on the jQuery team, uh, this already exists in jQuery UI as buck.widget. Um, Scott Gonzalez has a blog post on it. There's also some documentation that's forthcoming uh, that does what we've covered and then some. Uh, so uh, check that out. Uh, that's the, uh, the second link here. The first link is uh, James Podolsi's uh, link on uh, how jQuery plugins are broken. The, the initial example I showed you, that's, he's going into that same sort of uh, explanation. And uh, if you want your mind blown and, and you want to see 40 different ways to write a plugin, Adi Osmani's got a GitHub repo uh, with a tremendous number of different approaches uh, at the third link there. Uh, and this will all, of course, be in the slides uh, on the events website. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I'm Shane Riley. Thanks for uh, listening. <laughs>